Hey, it's Prerak and this is episode 3 of Many on the Laura All Wheel Drive series. In this episode, we will be replacing the rear subframe and the fuel tank of the car. Why do we need to change that though? Let's understand. The stock subframe does not have a place to mount the rear differential and cannot be used for all-wheel drive purposes. While the rear subframe out of a Skoda Superb 3.6 VR6 or any all-wheel drive VAT not only has a place to mount it, but it has it installed already. And the new subframe mounts to the car on the same mounting points as the stock subframe. The fuel tank needs to be replaced as the stock tank due to its shape comes in the way of the propeller shaft, which is needed to transmit power to the rear differential. Fuel tank out of any Skoda Superb or Yeti has a split in the middle, allowing the propeller shaft to pass through easily without interfering. Knowing this, we started the process of removing the stock rear subframe from the car. First, we jacked it up to a suitable height and placed it on jack stands. I had these trolleys made to move such heavy stuff around and these were very helpful while removing the subframe. We removed the 4 main bolts of the subframe, 8 more bolts which hold the trailing arm joint to the body and removed the rear strut mounts, after which we could slowly lower the subframe onto the trolleys. We took out the exhaust as well, as it would come in the way of the new subframe. The fuel tank is held in by a single strap, fuel lines and a couple of bolts on top at the nozzle. They were undone and the fuel tank was removed as well. It was half full so we very professionally drained it into a container as well and later used it in all of our cars. With this, the new parts were ready to go onto the car, but they were a little dirty, so we dragged them outside for a quick wash. They looked like a brand new part after the wash despite being 13 years old. The new fuel tank has two halves and two openings. One holds the fuel pump and the other holds the secondary fuel level sender. Not only that but it also has a location where Heldex connector will come out of. So our car needs an opening here. The hole is just blocked off and the template is quite clear. So just by following that, a new hole can be cut here easily. We made several holes along the perimeter and then finally took a grinder to it to finish the job. It took me quite some time to give this hole some finishing. Meanwhile, my friends enjoyed some endless scrolling and took some much needed rest. The exposed metal was then cleaned thoroughly and then spray painted white to avoid rusting in the future. The fuel tank was now ready to be mounted. It is held in place by three straps. One of the strap gets mounted to the stock tank's strap location. The other strap's back side can be mounted to a pre-existing hole provided in the body and for the front side a new hole needs to be drilled. The location exists already, but the hole is just blocked off. So after drilling a hole, a bolt can be added to mount the fuel tank firmly on two straps. The third strap required another hole, 
but we skipped that for now as I want to utilize revnets for this process and not to pass through bolts through the body. This can be added later. As I mentioned, this tank has a secondary fuel level sender. So a 3 pin connector needs to be wired to the instrument cluster to accurately let it know about the amount of fuel present in the tank. From exactly this location, a 6 pin connector needs to be wired later once the rear subframe is mounted. With the fuel tank installed, we were now ready to lift the new rear subframe in place. Placing them on the trolleys on each side, we brought it under the vehicle, then slowly tried to lift it into place. The center of mass of this subframe is a little off due to Heldex being there. So two jacks were utilized to lift it up into place, one on the differential and the other on the center of the subframe. The entire process involved a lot of readjusting putting the struts in correctly, putting the springs in place and making sure they seat properly. After a lot of work, the subframe was in place and the bolts could be put in. The subframe was finally on the car with all its bolts. The car now had rear differential, rear axles, bigger 310mm rear brakes as the VR6 got bigger brakes all around and a headlights unit controlling the power transmission to the rear wheels. Once the wheels were put on, the car could finally rest on its own wheels. You must have noticed in the previous episode that the engine was sitting outside of the car. We had done this to make the process of swapping transmissions and wiring easier. With the limited space we had and no lift, it made sense to take apart the front and remove the engine. But now with the transmission ready, fuel tank and rear subframe ready, we could finally put all of this back together. So we started off by putting the flywheel onto the engine. Then the gearbox was mated to it. Once the gearbox and engine were finally one unit again, the car was lowered to accept the engine in it. The engine was slid into place and the car was slowly lowered to mount the engine. With the engine now mounted, Aryan and Sahaj made quick work of filling the gearbox and engine with their necessary fluids. And once all the accessories were installed, we tried starting it up. But it didn't start. If you watched the last episode, you know I had wired the starter incorrectly. And after sorting that out, it fired right up. Nuro? We were desperate to get the car back on the ground and test it. So we added everything we had removed with major components mounted. We mounted the front core support, front axles and the front subframe. The car was then lowered on all fours. It was then moved out of the workspace for its first time running in four months. Running on its own power now with an automatic gearbox.
This is not the end however. You never really noticed us install the propeller shaft, did you? Well, we left that for the very end. As these two pieces need to be welded to the chassis of the car in order to mount the propeller shaft. We were planning to do that as well, but the morning after the first drive, I noticed this. Yup, it was leaking gear oil. This entire transmission works on hydraulic pressure. So it leaking oil was not a good news. We decided to give the car and ourselves a much needed rest. I put back all the fascia of the car and brought it home to rest. As I had my final exams coming up as well and could not spare a single day on this. So it sat there in my parking, leaking oil for quite some time. Until recently, when I could finally get the time to rectify this. So in the next episode, you will watch me fix the oil leak, get the mounts welded and hopefully watch all four tires spin. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next one. Some kind of butterfly